We're studying the Ten Commandments, and the one we get to now might be the most off-broken commandment. This is going to be tough, but stay with me. We can't avoid the difficult topics just because they make us uncomfortable, and we certainly can't skip a commandment. The fourth commandment has to do with time management and priority management. Managing your time is easy, right? After all, think about it. We've got all kinds of time-saving devices that previous generations didn't have. We have microwaves, so you can make dinner faster. And those of you who don't know how to operate ovens, you can push buttons on a microwave. We have email and text messaging, so you don't have to actually take time and talk to people. <laughs> we have digital cameras, so you don't have to wait to see your pictures. Don't want to spend time vacuuming? You can get a handy robot vacuum that will do the job for you. I want one of those. They just look so fun. I want to watch our dog when the robot vacuum goes around. <laughs> we have online church, so you don't have to get out of bed. We have Amazon and same-day delivery and food delivery services and whatever that thing is called at Kroger, click list, so you don't have to get out of your vehicle and go in to grocery shop. No more reading maps because we have GPS, so I can get lost faster. <laughs> True, I, GPS makes no difference, GPS map, whatever. Travel quicker than ever before. A Couple months ago, I left church Sunday afternoon, went to Spain, and was back in time for church Wednesday night. We have WebMD, so you don't have to go to the doctor to get a diagnosis. Little rash on your arm, look it up, you know it's leprosy. <laughs> Isn't it awesome how much time we're saving? We should have all kinds of time for rest and church and family and God. But in spite of all of those time-saving devices, people seem more and more busy. ABC News said, not only are Americans working longer hours than any time since statistics have been kept, but now they're also working longer than anyone else in the industrialized world. And while workers in other countries have been seeing their hours cut back by legislation focusing on preventing work from infringing on private life, Americans have been going in the other direction. So, how about you? Do you have more time or do you have less time? Let's take a poll. If you're too busy and you don't seem to have enough time, I want you to stand. This is not a trick. Just tell the truth. Too busy, don't seem to have enough time, I want you to stand. Okay? If you're less busy than ever before and you feel like you've got a great life balance, I want you to stand. About six of you. Obviously, this fourth commandment is one we need to talk about. God said, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant. Anybody have servants? Probably not. Nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in, that is not talking like aliens, all right? I just, I just realized that. So we're not talking Martians have come, and you're not supposed to make them work. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, all that's in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So before we go any further, uh, let me confess, this is the commandment I've been dreading because this is the one I struggle with the most. There are three parts to this commandment, keeping the Sabbath holy, work, and rest. I do great with the first two parts, work and keeping the Sabbath holy. I don't do nearly as well with the third part, rest. So I'm not teaching this from a position of strength, do as I do. Instead, I'm teaching this from a position of weakness. I'm a fellow struggler 
who needs to learn how to fully follow and obey this commandment. I have to change in order to be obedient to the Lord. If you don't struggle with this commandment, then your role is to listen and then encourage those of us who do struggle. As we work through this, I want you to grade yourself on each of the three parts. Work, keeping the Sabbath holy, and rest. The commandment starts, six days shall you labor and do all your work. From the very beginning, God intended people to work. God never intended you for you to be lazy and idle. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, Paul said, Even when we are with you, we gave you this rule. If a man will not work, he shall not eat. We hear that some among you are idle. They are not busy. They are busy buddies. Such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and earn the bread they eat. And as for you, brothers, never tire of doing right. The message says it this way. Don't you remember the rule we had when we lived with you? If you don't work, you don't eat. And now we're getting reports that a bunch of lazy good-for-nothings are taking advantage of you. This must not be tolerated. We command them to get to work immediately. No excuses, no arguments. Earn their own keep. Friends, don't slack off in doing your duty. Now, don't read that and say, then why do we hand out food for the hungry? They should work more and buy their own food. This passage isn't talking about people who are struggling to make ends meet or people who are hungry and don't have enough food. This isn't biblical justification to be selfish and stingy. Because we have to look at the words of Jesus. Matthew 25, he was talking about when we will all stand before him in judgment. And Jesus said, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you, a stranger, and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for the least of these, you did for me. And Proverbs 25, 21 says, if your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he's thirsty, give him water to drink. James 3, 27 says, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. When you care for and feed the hungry, God responds with blessing. However, if you are a lazy, unwilling to work sluggard trying to sponge off others and get a handout, then you're violating the fourth commandment. Get up and get a job. God said, you shall labor. So how do you do on this part? Grade yourself in the blank that I put on your outline. On this one, I gave myself an A. I get accused of a lot of things. I've never been accused of being lazy. I give the church 60 to 70 hours a week of hard work. I earn my food. Work hard. Give it all. Do your best. But remember, according to the fourth commandment, there is one day. It's supposed to be set aside, not for work, but for God. God said, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Something that is holy is different. It's unique. It's special. The Sabbath is to be treated with special care and significance. How do you do that? Well, the first step is clear. Stop working. The word Sabbath means to cease or to stop. But the Sabbath wasn't just a day to rest. It was also a day to worship and replenish the soul. Leviticus 23 calls the Sabbath a day of sacred assembly, meaning a time for God's people together for worship. Keeping the Sabbath holy also means to dedicate it for worship. Now, some people think the fourth commandment no longer applies because the New Testament doesn't say we have to keep the Sabbath. But Jesus practiced keeping the Sabbath. With a whole new understanding of it, Luke 4.16 says, He went to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up. On the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. In other words, that's what he did every Sabbath. And he stood up to read. 
you might say that Jesus observed the Sabbath by going to church. So here's what, here's what we're going to avoid as we deal with this commandment. We are not gonna, going to argue about whether the Sabbath should be on Saturday or Sunday. Okay? We have church both days. So if you're a Saturday Sabbath person, see you Saturday nights at 5 o'clock. If you are a Sunday Sabbath person, we'll see you Sunday morning. As we, as we consider the practice of the early church in the book of Acts, we see that something changed their practice of the Sabbath. The Jewish Sabbath, which they always kept, was on the seventh day of the week, which we call Saturday. But Jesus was raised from the dead, not on the seventh day, but on the first day of the week, Sunday. And it seems that in response, the early church changed their habit. Acts 20, 27 says, on the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. So Saturday or Sunday, it's not the day that matters, but the fact that we set aside a day for God to worship and keep the day holy. Because God commanded, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. When I grew up, Sundays were reserved for two things, church and rest. Sundays weren't a day to play sports or hang out with friends. It wasn't a day for family time. It was a holy day. And it was a day that we honored God by keeping the fourth commandment. 1981, the movie Chariots of Fire told the story of Eric Liddell. He served God as a missionary. He died in an internment camp in China in 1945. Eric Liddell was also the British record holder for the 100 meters. During the 1924 Paris Olympics, Liddell found out that he was supposed to run the 100 meters on a Sunday. But because he believed in observing the Sabbath, he decided not to run. He was criticized by his teammates, by his countrymen, even by the leaders of his own country. But he still refused to run. Instead, he decided to run the 400 meters, which wasn't his best event. Just before he ran the 400 meters, someone handed him a note that said, Them that honor me, I will honor. 1 Samuel 2.30 and that day, Eric Liddell set a new world record in the 400 meters. Most importantly, he honored the Lord, and he kept the Sabbath. Times have changed, and I'm not sure we're better. Our great-grandfathers called it the Holy Sabbath. Our grandparents called it the Sabbath. Our parents called it Sunday. Now we call it the weekend or Sunday fun day. But in the fourth commandment, God gave instructions about that one day a week. It's more than a weekend. It's supposed to be a day reserved for God, a holy day. And sadly, the ignoring the command to keep the Sabbath holy and reserved for God is almost part of our culture. Instead of church, we have tournaments and travel teams. Instead of spending time in God's house, we have family time. Lake day is more important than God's day. Now, I'm not against tournaments, travel teams, family time, or the lake. Those are all wonderful when they're kept in the right place. But when they become a Sabbath replacement, they're idols that we worship instead of the Lord. When you think about it that way, some people break three of the first four commandments at the same time. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself an idol and remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. I guess if you cuss on the ball field, the lake, or the golf course, you can make it for four for four. <laughs> Church attendance is down in America even as the same percentage of Americans call themselves Christians. You used to give three time slots a week to the Lord. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, now you give God about one out of every three Sundays and you feel like you're doing him a favor. The problem is God said, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, reserved for the Lord. Now, we've been afraid to address this in church because we don't want to tick people off. We're afraid they'll leave to our church and go to another lower commitment church that will make them feel good. Now, I understand that temptation. We can't ignore this. This is one of the big ten. 
So grade yourself. How are you doing on keeping the Sabbath day holy? Where does God fit in your weekend? I gave myself another A. I'm feeling pretty good about this commandment right now. But now we come to the final part, the area where I struggle, rest. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that's in him. But he rested on the seventh day. Inc. Magazine said, how did the elite signal to each other how important they are? I am slammed is a socially acceptable way of saying I am important. Fifty years ago, Americans signaled their class by displaying their leisure. Think bankers hours, nine to three. Today, the working rich display their extreme schedules. What a twisted, unbiblical approach, actually bragging about being busy. I listen to people who are proud of the fact that they don't get enough sleep. 2014, my friend Jim Bradford spoke here. Jim is the pastor of Central Assembly of God in Springfield, Missouri, and he's also a rocket scientist, literally a rocket scientist. He's both smart and he's wise, a rare combination. At the time, Jim was serving in a national uh, leadership role with the Assemblies of God. In that role, Jim observed trends in churches, and he coached, he coached pastors on how to be more effective. So I invited Jim not just to preach on the weekend, but also to stay with us through our whole arc of meetings on Mondays. He taught in our various meetings that day to, to the staff and to the creative team and to the campus pastors. And then Monday night, Jim had dinner with and he taught our board. And at the end of his teaching, he opened it up for questions and answers. And I don't know, remember who asked, but one of our board members asked, what are the red flags for our church? What are the things we need to be worried about? Jim turned to me and he said, you really want me to answer this with you sitting there? Which at that point, I had a pretty good idea that it wasn't going to be an answer I was going to like. But I'm committed to hearing truth from people who love me. And so I said, go ahead. I, Jim said to our board, I've watched Pastor Rod and his schedule. If he doesn't change, in five years, he'll either kill himself or plateau the church. And the room grew quiet. Jim then challenged me to change my rhythm, to take a regular day off, to schedule times for rest, and to even consider a sabbatical a month away from the church to renew and refresh and be restored. I'm four years down the road from that conversation. I've improved in some ways. I've cut back on my travel. I'm saying no more often. I haven't taken a sabbatical, but several times in the last four years, I've taken four or five days to rest. But I haven't taken extended time, even though the board has encouraged that. And I'm doing really poorly at taking a day off every week. It doesn't happen often. I don't want to admit to you the number of days I've taken off this year. It's rather ironic. But at one point, I was scheduled to miss today to spend time resting. And I canceled my rest to be here, not realizing what was going to be on the schedule and what I was going to be talking about. <laughs> Too many people are tired. A photographer was taking pictures of first graders in an elementary school, and he was just making small talk to put the kids at ease. And he asked one little girl, what are you going to be when she grow up, when you grow up? And she answered, tired. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? When you ask people, isn't that always the answer? How you doing? I'm super busy. I'm tired. Nobody ever says, man, I got all kinds of free time. I'm just having a great time. I am energized, just looking for something to do. Being exhausted can make you dangerous. Some of the most notorious industrial accidents of the modern world, the Exxon Valdez, Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, occurred in the middle of the night. In the Challenger space shuttle disaster, NASA officials made the decision to go ahead with the launch after working 20 hours straight and only getting two to three hours of sleep the night before. And that error in judgment cost the lives of seven astronauts. 
We ignore our need for rest and renewal at the peril of others and ourselves. Perhaps the greatest danger is the harm we do to our own souls. I wonder if busyness could be another form of idolatry. Barbara Brown Taylor wrote this way, Some of us have made an idol of exhaustion. The only time we know we've done enough is when we're running on empty and when the ones we love the most are the ones we see the least. When we lie down to sleep at night, we offer our full appointment calendars to God instead of prayer, believing that God, who is as busy as we are, will surely understand. So what's the answer to the problem? How do you find rest and renewal, not just for your body, but also your soul? Well, the answer is in the fourth commandment. The Sabbath principle gives you a day of rest. It's a day to catch your breath. It's a day not to work. If you're a full-time homemaker, it's a day for you to have a break from the grind of cooking and cleaning and getting things done. If you're a student, it's a day for you to rest from the burden of endless books to read and papers to write and projects to finish. Listen to me, students. Take a day a week and don't do homework. I thought I'd get more amens than that. I probably got them in Hornell. Thanks, guys. If you're a teacher, it's not catch-up a day. It's a day for you to put it all down. Take a break from grading papers and planning. Stop preparing work for you and those students. You'll all feel better. If If you work in an office, it's a day to put down your phone and your computer. Pay attention to the family and friends that are right in front of you. If you're a builder, it's a day not to build. If you're an artist, enjoy someone else's creativity for the day. If you work inside, go outside for a day. If you work outside, stay inside in the nice air conditioning. Whatever work you do, stop once a week and relax. Instead of working, do things that refuel your body, your mind, your relationships, and soul. If you like movies, I don't understand you at all. No, I mean, go, go see a good movie. If you like to ride your bike, do that. If you like to hike, go for it. If you like to read, read a good book. If you like to garden, I don't understand you either. (laughs) But plant some flowers. Come up to the church and prune some stuff. The important thing is to detach yourself from everyday work. The Sabbath is a time to say, I'm not a human doing, I'm a human being. I am more than my work. It requires faith. You have to decide, I'll stop working, and I'll trust, that, that, trust God that the work I could be doing on this day will somehow get done, that God will see to that. And as I honor him, he'll take care of me. Truett Cathy, the founder of Chick-fil-A, God's favorite restaurant, <laughs> in 1948 declared that his restaurants would remain closed on Sunday. He made the decision, knowing that he would lose millions of dollars in business, to honor the Lord's Day because he knew his employees needed a day of rest and a day to honor God. If you ignore this part of the fourth commandment, your need to rest, the result is burnout and stress. And often, it leads to a relaxing of boundaries because you're tired that leads to moral failure. Not resting is dangerous for your body, your spirit, and your soul. And you say, Pastor Rod, this this all sounds great. I need to rest, but I can't seem to get there because there's so much pressure. There's pressure from the kids to have more. There's pressure from your spouse to love more. There's pressure from your boss to do more. There's pressure from the American ideal to achieve more. There's pressure from your creditors to pay more. There's pressure from your parents to perform on a higher level. There's pressure from fear and pressure from past failures and pressure from temptation. There's pressure from school. There's pressure from anxiety. Pressure, pressure, pressure. And the personal pressure you put on yourself is the heaviest of all. You think it's not supposed to be this way. I'm not supposed to feel this way. I'm not supposed to live like this. 
In Jesus' day, people understood pressure and being tired because every time a new religious leader showed up, they showed up with a new list of requirements and laws and commands. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, all of them, they all had a new way that made it harder to please God. Whenever a new Jewish rabbi came to town, it cost the people more time, more energy, and more money with more rules to memorize. And then like a fresh wind on a summer afternoon or a cool drink on a hot day, Jesus stepped on the scene. And he reminded people of the fourth commandment in a beautiful way. Here's what Jesus said to hundreds of stressed, overworked, pressured, overworried people. Matthew 11, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Doesn't that sound wonderful? You can find rest and peace in Jesus. When you're too busy for God, you're too busy. When you're too busy to pray, it's too busy. When you're too busy for church, there's something wrong with your pace. You need to make some adjustments. When you're too busy for rest, you're going to crash. It's time to slow down, to reprioritize, and to obey the fourth commandment. So grade yourself in this area. How are you doing? I gave myself a C minus because giving myself a D would add more pressure. I didn't want to do that. <laughs> but I want you to know I'm working to change. I have to. For my good and for good, the good of this church, I have to obey this commandment. I'm committed to change. And you have to obey this commandment. It's not optional. That's the problem with all these commandments. They're called the Ten Commandments. Not, here's ten suggestions. Three things to consider. Do you need to get to work? Have you been lazy and expecting other people to take care of your needs? If so, obey that part of the commandment. Get to work. Do you need to reprioritize church and get back to keeping the Sabbath day holy? To which you say, but Pastor Rod, you don't know what I'll have to give up. Listen to yourself. Do you need to observe Sabbath rest and be recharged? Is it time to clear some things from your schedule? We can't avoid this commandment, guys. Because God said, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you'll labor and do your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth. The sea is all that in them. But even the Lord rested on the seventh day. Therefore... The Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Would you bow your heads with me? I want to pray for you. This one's tough because most of us, on one level, it hits us. We can't avoid this. So I want to pray for you. Lord, I, I pray for some people in this room watching or watching online 
that they need to hear your command to get to work. They've been expecting other people to take care of them while they didn't work. So I pray they'd be obedient to your command to work. And then, Lord, there are those who um, the Sabbath day has been long forgotten. It's the weekend, and if it's convenient, we include Jesus. Lord, would you help us to obey this part of your instructions that we're to keep the Sabbath day holy. It's a time for rest and it's a time for you. Lord, that we would reprioritize you in our schedules instead of you fitting in when it works or it's convenient. You'd have first place. And then, Lord, I pray for people who need rest. Who when I talk about pressure, they just, they feel that continual pressure that just presses on them and presses on them and presses on them. Lord, I pray that in you, they would find rest and peace and wholeness and refreshing. Lord, we, we repent of the idol of busyness. Thinking that we always have to be doing something. And we ask you, Lord, to give us rest. Keep your head bowed. I want to pray for you if you are distressed. If you're stressed out and under pressure, I want to pray for you. I'm not going to have you stand up or come to the front because that would probably make more stress. But if that's you, would you just raise your hand and we're going to pray. Okay, a whole lot of us. So here's what I want you to do so somebody will pray with you. Just reach over and grab the hand of the person next to you. Even if you don't know them, do it. And while I pray for you, that person is going to pray for you as well. And we're just going to agree together that that pressure will be relieved and that God will give you rest. Lord, I pray for my friends. Her just feeling pressure and stress. Lord, sometimes that pressure and stress causes us to, unhealthy, to do unhealthy things. We run to addiction. We self-medicate. We burn out. We, we don't spend time with the people who we love the most. So, Lord, today, we give you the pressure. Believing you can handle it. You experience everything that we experience while you lived on this earth. You dealt with unbelievable pressure, and so we give you ours right now. Lord, I pray for people who it just seems like with every, with every day and every moment, there's another decision, there's just something else they have to do. I pray, God, just in the quietness of this moment, that you would give them the rest and peace that comes from your presence. Lord, I pray for people who are stressed out and just, they feel nervous and anxious, don't even know why. They have trouble going to sleep at night because their mind is racing with everything they have to do and everything that went wrong that day. Lord, would you bring sweet rest and peace like only you can give. You said, come to me. All you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And I pray, Lord, for rest right now. Rest for anxious mind. Rest for weary bodies. Rest for restless souls. Because, Lord, you promised us rest. So bring the sweet peace, Lord, that only you can bring. And I pray, God, that just in the next... Uh, 36 hours, 48 hours, that they'd find a time and a place to just rest in your presence and be renewed and refreshed by you. Lord, we, we confess our need for you. We're a people who really need our Lord. Grant your sweet rest, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.